Imagine a 21st century dictator. We're willing to bet that one a few people sprung to mind Vladimir Putin of Russia, Kim Jong un of North Korea, Xi Jinping of China, or maybe Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. Perhaps you might know some of the niche picks as well. Maybe Turkey's Erdogan or Rwanda's Kagame. But unless you're a particularly keen and diligent observer of global authoritarianism, we'd be willing to bet that the dictator of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, did not feature prominently on your list. And while that certainly isn't your fault, it is a bit of a problem. Currently serving his fourth consecutive term in office, Daniel Ortega leads a regime that has been likened to Nazi Germany for the severity and sheer number of human rights abuses committed by his government. Far from his former reputation as a Marxist-Leninist reformer, Ortega has devolved in recent years into a pure tyrant, unmarried from any perceptible political ideology or basic principle of morality. With his wife, that's Vice President Rosario Murillo, firmly by his side, and a legion of sons and daughters intent on helping the family business, the Ortega regime is quickly transforming into a dynasty, and one that may rule Nicaragua for decades to come. Born as Jose Daniel Ortega Saavedra on November the 11th, 1945, the child who would one day grow up to be President Daniel Ortega was the son of working-class political dissidents in the city of La Libertad. Growing up in Nicaragua, Ortega faced difficult circumstances. His mother was imprisoned by the regime of Anastasio Somoza de Bale, the third member of the Somoza dynasty that had ruled Nicaragua at the time. As such, Ortega built a resentment for the Somoza regime from an early age, but at such a young age, there was very little could actually do about it. In the mid-1950s, the Ortega family moved to the city of Managua, Nicaragua's capital. There, the young Daniel Ortega carried on his studies while paying very close attention to the lessons of his father, who was particularly passionate in denouncing the United States' history of military intervention in Nicaragua and the clear support that the administrations in Washington were showing for President Somoza. This anti-American sentiment struck a chord with Ortega, who grew increasingly aware of the role massive geopolitical players could have in a small country like his, and much like millions of young teenagers looking to piss off the man, Ortega began to seek out the political ideology that the United States cared so much about repressing. When Ortega was 14, he met a man named Carlos Fonseca Amador, the founder of the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN. Descended from the legacy of revolutionary Augusto Cesar Sandino, the Sandinistas had maintained a low-level insurgency against the Somoza regime for years, and young Ortega wanted in on that action. After a brief stint at Managua's Central American University, Ortega quickly dropped out before going underground and joining up with the Sandinistas at the age of 18. Joined by his brothers Humberto and Camillo, Ortega quickly became a rising star among the Sandinistas and took control of their urban resistance campaign within just four years. But life as an insurgent was not easy for Ortega either. Arrested in Guatemala in 1964, Ortega would be tortured at the hands of the Nicaraguan National Guard, specifically a guardsman named Gonzalo Lacayo. Ortega was lucky enough to be released from detention alive and would later have Gonzalo Lacayo assassinated in retribution, but shortly after this hit took place, Ortega would be arrested again. This time, the situation would be worse. After attempting to rob a Bank of America, Ortega would be imprisoned for seven years, only being released in 1974 as part of a prisoner swap between the Sandinistas and the Somoza government. Ortega endured yet more severe torture while in prison, but he also took the opportunity to write while his mother used the publicity to rally support for better treatment of political prisoners in Nicaragua. After his release in 1974, Ortega would be exiled to Cuba, which, pro tip for the Somoza dictatorship, really is not the place to send young Marxists with a capacity for violence. Unsurprisingly, Ortega received training in guerrilla warfare from Fidel Castro's government before sneaking back into Nicaragua. When he returns, Ortega found a very different Sandinista faction than he left behind, one marked by factionalism and a lack of vision, even despite its relatively improved numbers. Ortega and his brother Umberto responded by forming an insurrectionist wing of the Sandinistas known as the Tercerista, or the Third Way, which hoped to fuse the Sandinistas' guerrilla warfare tactics with other anti somoza groups in civil society. With his organization and leadership, plus the endorsement of communist rock star dictators like Fidel Castro, Ortega turned the Sandinistas from a low-grade insurgency to a force capable of bringing down the Somoza regime for the first time. 
It was also during these years that Ortega met and later married Rosario Murillo, a young revolutionary and language professor six years his junior. Murillo had a familial connection to the revolutionary leader Ortega revered, Augusto Sandino, and she had dedicated herself totally to working with the Sandinistas. She and Ortega met in Costa Rica, just over the Nicaraguan border, where Ortega was at work coordinating the Sandinista revolution. During these years, Ortega also lost his brother Camillo, who died taking part in the lead-up to the full-scale popular revolt. When the revolution succeeded in July 1979, Ortega became one of the five leaders of Nicaragua's ruling military junta. He was named coordinator in 1981, giving him functional control of the country, which he parlayed into a successful presidential run in 1984. That election is still recognized as having been mostly free and mostly fair, but was used in the United States by President Ronald Reagan to gin up support for armed counter-revolutionary movements in the region. As a Marxist, Ortega immediately became part of the same geopolitical games he had disdained Somoza for playing, although Ortega no doubt perceived himself to be on the right side of the issue, whereas Somoza had been content in Ortega's mind as an American puppet. The American CIA and the Reagan government initiated a policy to arm a counter-revolutionary movement known as the Contras. And while we don't have time to cover the entire Iran-Contra affair here, suffice to say that it led to the deaths of over 30,000 Nicaraguans from varying sides. Ortega's first stint as president was marked by important changes in Nicaragua, campaigns for mass polio vaccinations, the promotion of a mixed public and private economy, a bold literacy campaign, and significant land redistribution. But it was also marked by ethnocide, with Ortega's regime forcing over 10,000 members of the Mosquito indigenous population to be displaced within the country. This led the Mosquito peoples, as well as a number of other opposition groups, to take up arms and rebel against the Sandinistas in an effort that the American Reagan administration was more than happy to support. This would later become known as the Iran-Contra affair. The Ortega government had already shown a willingness to kill or disappear members of the opposition, and the Contra intervention continued for several years, contributing to public discontent with his regime. Ortega lost a bid for re-election to Violeta Burrios de Chamorro, a former colleague in Nicaragua's military junta who had now garnered support from the country's anti-Sandinista faction, as well as the US government. Chamorro shocked the world and won what most international observers believed would be a sham election to keep Ortega in power. Now, it is entirely possible that this was the plan by Ortega, but voter intimidation, electoral violence, and intense economic pressure from the United States were enough to get Chamorro into office nonetheless. Over the following decade and a half, Ortega would sit on the sidelines, losing the 1996 and 2001 elections. However, he continued to wield considerable influence over the country's politics, and by 2006 he was able to return to power. But the Daniel Ortega, who was elected in 2006, was oh so very different from the one who had led the Sandinistas to power. Once an avowed atheist, Ortega had strongly caught a Catholics, both via expressions of his own faith and the embrace of socially conservative politics, including a strict ban on all abortions. He had successfully worked behind the scenes to make the Sandinistas one of only two political parties with any level of real power in Nicaragua, lowered the threshold for a president to be elected by plurality, and ratcheted up anti-American rhetoric for a 2001 election that came just after the 9-11 terror attacks. In 2006, Ortega was elected with just 38% of the vote, and this time he had done all the requisite work to ensure that he would never be ousted again. Now. We'll dig much further into the modern Ortega regime in just a moment, but before we do, let's meet the Ortega family in their current form. As you should expect, Daniel Ortega is firmly entrenched as the family patriarch, currently four terms into his second administration. As of now, he's 77 years old. His wife, Rosaria Maria, serves as vice president, but is functionally much more of a co-president at this point, with open questions as to just how much of her husband's actions are her doing. Surrounding Daniel and Rosario are their nine adult children, with the oldest two having been adopted by the Ortegas after their mother's previous marriage. The eldest of the nine, Zoyal America, is exiled from Nicaragua for reasons that we're absolutely going to get into, while the other eight, Camilla Antonia, Carlos Enrique, Daniel Edmundo, Juan Carlos, Loriano Facundo, Luciana Caterina, Maurice Facundo, and Rafael Antonio, all hold the official rank of presidential advisors. They control the distribution of Nicaragua's oil and run most TV channels in Nicaragua as well 
well as the advertisers that run commercials on them. They also live in what's been described as a golden cage. Although they wield impressive power within Nicaragua and each have millions of dollars to their name, they are entirely unable to travel out of the country without their parents' express agreement. They also aren't Ortega's successors. That honor goes explicitly to Vice President Murillo. Quite possibly, one of them will be named Murillo's successor when the time is right, and several may have a claim within the family. For example, Laureano has cultivated strong connections in domestic and international business, while Juan Carlos has aggressively condemned the U.S. before the organization of American states, and, and Camilla has taken a role firmly at her mother's right hand. But it is Vice President Murillo who has the final say on the children, the grandchildren, and quite possibly the government. As such, we'll be referring to Ortega throughout the remainder of this video. But as we do, it's important to understand that his decisions are inseparable from those of his family, and most particularly, his wife. So, with our family history in mind, we can take a closer look at the multi-headed hydra that the Ortega dynasty has become. A quick disclaimer before that, though, after some 17 years straight of Ortega rule, there are a good number of political nuances that we just don't have time to cover here. Policies which have been amended for the better or for the worse after being enacted. Rather than get bogged down in the minutiae, though, we'll be focusing on their totalitarian greatest hits for the purposes of this video. When Ortega took power again in 2007, it was in a brief moment of optimism that he might be able to eliminate hunger among the poor in Nicaragua and maintain at least a passable relationship with the United States and the Nicaraguan private sector. This illusion, though, died very quickly. Within a year, Ortega began restricting the free press and denying journalists access to information issued by or written about the government. Ortega also made overtures to Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, and although he was able to somewhat reduce poverty, grow the GDP, and reduce unemployment using money made from the resale of discounted Venezuelan oil, he also tended toward another Chavez-like move, making himself president for life. Nicaragua has sharply constrained its presidents to a single term at a time. Even if they become president again later, they can't serve two terms consecutively. But, courtesy of Ortega, that rule was done away with. Ortega's economic successes turned him into a populist hero among Nicaragua's poor, while his escalating crackdowns quickly saw him assume greater control of the middle and upper classes. By intimidating, threatening, and imprisoning members of Nicaragua's opposition parties while inflaming their internal divisions, Ortega was able to ensure that no significant movement could rise to challenge his authority, and with that outlet removed, he was able to expand his executive powers with impunity. Today, Ortega has constitutional leeway to rule basically by decree, and when he opened the door for his wife, who was already the government's spokeswoman to become the vice president, there was no organization with a chance of stopping it. Ortega has never had much tolerance for political opposition, and even less for public protest to his rule, especially when that protest equates him to the dictators of the Somoza regime, the same regime Ortega grew up resisting. It's certainly uncanny that Ortega bears such a resemblance to the monsters that he once fought against, but the man himself has had none of it. A rise in protests in April 2018 saw the Ortegas unleash a combination of police and paramilitary enforcers on demonstrators who had been incensed by an attempt to reform Nicaragua's social security system. We should note that some of these protesters were armed, including with Molotov cocktails and makeshift mortars, but the vast majority were unarmed and peaceful. It didn't matter, though. Over 300 Nicaraguans were killed in the protests, and not just by indiscriminate fire during marches. Thousands of people were arbitrarily detained, tortured, and attacked, not just by representatives of the government, but by private militia groups with no authorization to use force. The crackdowns were highly coordinated and so disproportionately violent and cruel that they have since been condemned as crimes against humanity. Since the 2018 protests, Ortega has manipulated the situation further, condemning the protests as an attempted coup and leveraging his control of Nicaraguan media, again overseen by his children, to make his chosen narrative far more persuasive. What's more, the regime has turned to a more ubiquitous culture of suppression ever since then, with arbitrary detentions and disappearances of suspected dissidents becoming all the more common. In a country of under 7 million people, some 100,000 fled it in the months following the protests. The dynasty's next steps were to lock down any remaining avenue to public dissent or even political discourse. In late 2020, the legislature, controlled by Ortega's close allies, passed a cybercrime law that made it illegal to distribute information that isn't approved by the regime. Those laws have since been used to imprison numerous potential political opponents, including the daughter of former president Violeta Barrios de Chamorro. As should 
become clear between the Somozas, the Ortegas, and the Chamorros. Political dynasties are a sort of standard in Nicaragua, but the Ortega steps during this time went a long way to curtail the ability of any other family to even make their voice heard within the political establishment. The Ortega government hasn't just been defined by its state repression, though, but also by the family's own tendency to uh, skim off the top. Since the early 2010s, Ortega has been known to ensure that profits of Venezuelan oil found their way to companies controlled by the Ortega family and their close allies. His son, Rafael, who has proven himself to break out of his mother's golden cage in order to represent the family's business interests abroad, has been sanctioned by two successive US presidents on allegations of money laundering. In March of 2023, the regime dissolved major banks within Nicaragua, possibly intending to replace them with their own organizations, which would make additional money laundering far easier to accomplish while cutting off the Nicaraguan financial system from the outside world. And in addition to their violence and exploitation toward the people of Nicaragua, there is one more element of President Ortega's and Vice President Murillo's cruelty that must be addressed. Their personal offenses towards Murillo's firstborn daughter and Ortega's adopted daughter, Zoe America. In the late 1990s, Zoe America, born in 1967, publicly accused Ortega of raping her repeatedly as a child. Although Ortega had not been president at that time, he claimed immunity as a member of Nicaragua's Congress in order to avoid trial, and Zoe America's mother stood by her husband rather than her child. The incident was a major stain on both Ortega and Murillo's reputations, and after being shunned and harassed for years in Nicaragua, she was driven to exile in Costa Rica. Moving back to their more recent abuse allegations against the Nicaraguan people, the Ortegas have gone to great lengths to ensure that international NGOs working in support of human rights, public health, humanitarian aid, and other important causes are either dissolved or expelled from the country. Over 3,200 NGOs have been dissolved there since 2018. The regime justifying this action by implicating those NGOs in spreading dissent within Nicaragua. Universities have faced the same fate. As international interests have disappeared, Nicaragua's internal methods of social control have only grown stronger. Paramilitary forces, secret police, operate with impunity, while political prisoners are subject to deprivation of sleep and food, and they're forced to spend prolonged periods in solitary confinement. The economy has taken a nosedive. Poverty is through the roof. And now there is no relief in sight for the Nicaraguan people. In March of 2023, the United Nations released the results of an investigation that explored the Nicaraguan regime's abuses of power in an attempt to examine whether the nation's leaders could ever be tried by international courts. Their findings were released with a level of condemnation that the UN hardly ever brings to bear. In the words of Jan Michael Simon, who led the investigation to quote, the weaponizing of the justice system against political opponents in the way that is done in Nicaragua is exactly what the Nazi regime did. People massively stripped of their nationality and being expelled out of the country. This is exactly what the Nazis did too. The quote ends. The report calls for stronger international sanctions to back up the ones instituted by the American Biden administration and provided a strong case for the legal system of many nations to detain and even prosecute members of the regime if they were so interested. But it also spoke to the incredibly deep hold that the Ortegas have on their country and the continual weaponization of every institution at their disposal, the judiciary, the legislature, and the policing and carceral systems. In recent months, the Ortegas have used these institutions just as enthusiastically as ever. While exile has long been a part of Nicaragua's past and even Ortega's own personal history, it's also become institutionalized state practice. In one go, a judge stripped 300 Nicaraguans of their citizenship earlier this year, dismissing them as traitors to the Nicaraguan state. Journalists and human rights leaders imprisoned prior to 2021 elections continue to be incarcerated, including in a particularly dreaded prison known as El Chapote. And among everyday citizens, Ortega's social controls are settling in. The few citizens who choose to speak to Western media report a culture where the threat of being reported to authorities and branded a traitor deeply permeates even private conversations between friends and neighbors. The narrative they hear now comes almost fully from the vice president, who has become the regime's voice, potentially preparing to assume the presidency while her husband continues to operate from the shadows. Internationally, Nicaragua has become widely regarded as a pariah state, and predictably, it acts as one. 
Rumors abound in nearby Costa Rica and Guatemala that Nicaraguan agents are present tracking dissidents and even carried out violent attacks against them. The government also requires any Nicaraguan working for a foreign government, company, foundation, or organization to register as a foreign agent, thus prohibiting themselves from running for office or being at all involved with Nicaraguan domestic politics. In 2022, Nicaragua joined North Korea, Syria, and Belarus as the only nations to vote against condemning Russia for the invasion of Ukraine in the United Nations, and Ortega is on record inviting the Russian military to establish a presence in Nicaragua. Like many nations in the region, Nicaragua has been actively courted by China, and it should be no surprise that the Ortegas have been more than happy to hear China out. As for what can be done at this point, it's frankly quite difficult to identify any exit valve for the Nicaraguan people. Their options to resist the regime peacefully are extremely limited, not only because there are no remaining avenues to create a legal dispute with the government, but because that same government has made it exceedingly clear that even peaceful protest will be met with violent reprisals. For Nicaraguan expatriates and exiles living abroad, there is a somewhat better chance of being heard by the outside world, but expats who are unwilling or unable to leave Central America risk the attention of the Ortega regime's operatives in the region. And although the international community is showing greater and greater attention to the regime and even forming the basis for potential arrests internationally, those arrests will not come so long as Ortega, his wife, and his children remain within their golden cage in Nicaragua or travel to friendly global powers like Russia and China. So long as they remain within their own sphere of influence, the Ortega dynasty can operate with impunity. And short of yet another violation of Nicaragua's sovereignty, the options for intervention there are exceptionally limited. And so, as is sometimes the case on this channel, we must leave you with no happy or optimistic note to end on. Although I'd very much like to promise that the Ortega regime can be pushed out of power eventually, that its exploitation of Nicaragua may stop before it becomes a true multi-generational dynasty of tyrants, we can't do that. What we can do is leave you with the words of Zola America Ortega Murillo, exiled first daughter of Daniel Ortega and Rosaria Murillo, who knows, perhaps better than anybody, what it is like to live under a parent's rule. To quote, the abuser of a child captures, isolates, and brainwashes their victim. That is what is happening to Nicaragua, which is a political system controlled by one family that denies opposition. Mm -hmm.